All right, all right, is that on? Cool. So there are very few things that will enamor me completely. So this is the skull of Jane, the juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. I printed this, uh, at least partially, in a tutorial I did earlier. Um, you can see here, it's the mandible. This is almost a complete skull. And this cost $70 in materials. Steve, we got you. but how are we supposed to print something this freaking big on something this freaking small? So watch my original tutorial and now I'm gonna show you the process I use to put these larger prints together and this time rather than using a laser texture scan I'm gonna use data from a CT scanner. I am printing Joe who is a juvenile Parasaurolophus or duck-billed dinosaur. He's one of the most complete duckbills known and was only about a year old at the time of his death. He was found by Dr. Andrew Farkey's team in the Campanian Kuiperowitz Formation in southern Utah and is roughly 75 million years old in that ballpark. The impressions of soft tissue components were even preserved, evidenced by the ridges in the matrix near the premaxilla, representing Joe's keratinous beak. Overall, Joe's pretty important for studying the ontogeny of Parasaurolophus, as he shows that in the early development of the nasal passages, um, they account for most of the volume of the animal's crest. The left side of Joe's skull was CT scanned by Dr. Farkey to a slice thickness of 0.5 millimeters and a reconstruction diameter of 229.7 millimeters. It was then segmented and measured in 3D Slicer 4.2. Now Dr. Farkey was kind enough to convert some of the raw CT files of Joe's skull to printable STL and .obj formats. To www.peerj.com. PeerJ is an open source, peer-reviewed journal. It's uh, very popular um, for scientists to publish in right now because you can upload three-dimensional files as uh, supplemental information. Search ontogeny in the two crested dinosaur Parasaurolophus, Hadrosauridae, and Heteracrony in Hadrosaurids. And then scroll down until you get to this section that's labeled Table 1, Summary of Digital Data Available via Figshare. So you're going to see CT scan data, which are raw CT files, but you're also going to see these surface models. So wherever you see a surface model, specifically, what we're going to be printing is this surface model of the left half of the skull. Click on the URL. And it will bring you to a location where you can download an STL file. And here we scroll down and we can see a description of the data with the source, the original CT scan and file information that lets us know this is in STL format, STL file extension. So at this point, click download. I would suggest you have an external hard drive for this because CT scans are huge bits of data. And if you download too many of these, it's gonna, it's gonna run you down pretty quickly. So I downloaded the file and I uploaded it into our old friend MeshLab. Lab allows us to get really close to the scan and it lets us see some of the textures. So you see this popcorny stuff. This is actually traces of the matrix or, or rock that was not removed from the skull. It was actually included with the skull when they placed it in the scanner. This is covering what what is likely bone. It's just that this stuff has probably concretionary. It has iron, hematite, uh, very very well indurated minerals, and those are difficult to remove even using pneumatic tools. However, when you 3D print this, it's it's going to be super easy to remove. I'm going to be able to peel off this rock matrix as if it's nothing because a CT scanner actually shows differences in density among bone and among the rock that surrounds it. While this is just a surface model STL derived from a CT scan, the contacting surfaces of the rock and the bone are still distinguished. You can see here those ridges we saw earlier. These are remnants of the soft tissue. They're actually impressions of the keratin that was part of Joe's beak. 
This is the good side of the skull. We can see the orbit right here. This is where his eye was. We can see the dentary, the angular and the surangular, um, which articulate with the quadrate right here. Um, we can see the crest and the nasal cavities. So it's really cool that we actually have the scan. We can manipulate it and put it into our 3D printer. To finish it up, we need NetFab. Use the view functions to rotate it so you can see exactly where I made those cuts. I've actually already printed three sections of the skull. I've printed this area here with the orbit, the angular and the surangular back here, and the denner right over here. But what I have left to print is this piece right here, which represents the crust. This is the important bit. This is the bit that would be most fragile if we were trying to reproduce the specimen using traditional silicon molding. The UP software has several options for you to change the orientation of the object. And I'm going to do a rotation of 15 degrees on positive x-axis, and that is doing what I want it to. So now we're lifting, we're creating more room for the piece. I'll do it one more time. And now, so it's resting on the platform, I'll select Auto Placement. Where'd you go? And, miraculously, it looks like his crest is going to fit. That being said, we have some of these floating vectors here that represent the nasal, and we have to do a print preview to make sure the program can actually do this. I'll do a print preview at fine quality with an unsolid model. It's printable. It's going to use 72 grams, and it's going to take about 15 hours to print. After I ran the print preview, it's shown me where it's going to print the raft. And from this raft, several pillars are going to project all the way up to the overhangs on the specimen. And I have it set to 30 degrees. So any time that the angle of the part is greater than 30 degrees to the horizontal, um, it's going to add a support pillar so that uh, it's not just printing in thin air. And the support is very easy to remove. It, it doesn't affect the specimen. To begin, I first initialize the printer by clicking the red button on top. The light will then turn on and the printer will go through an initialization phase. Once that is completed, I check the perf board to make sure there's no excess filament left over from the last print, and then I replace. I then check to make sure that the connection with the power cord and the USB cable is secure. And then I check to make sure I have enough filament to complete the print. Then I make sure that the filament is stable and that the print head will not fall off. I heat the table for 15 minutes. And then I select the print option. the four printed parts including uh, the piece we just printed uh, that still has the support material attached I removed it from the other three pieces and I also have some sandpaper I have a pin vise just in case I need it 
um, as well as a little shot glass with a paintbrush. And you just sort of pop it. You get the point. Now that I've made a mess of removing all of the support material, you can see that these two pieces here are going to fit relatively cleanly, but it's good first to take an X-Acto knife and to make that a little more precise. This is where the sandpaper can come in as well, to sort of smooth it out. So, so why did I make you save all the support material? Well, that's what we need to make the glue. So you can see I have my little shot glass here. I've already uh, put a lot of glue. But uh, I'm going to reuse it. Just take little bits and pieces of the support material and drop it into any glass jar. Just make sure it's not plastic because the acetone will melt right through and you'll have a nasty mess on your hands. Pop open your acetone, pour it in, and then you're going to want to let that sit for probably 20 or 30 minutes. Just apply a coating on all the flat zones. And now I'll just take them. And hold it together. It's really cool because we can see this part right here. The replicated matrix is actually it's just popped out. It's so easy to remove. You can just put it right back in to the orbit. You may notice after gluing that there's going to be a small crack open between some of the spaces. To make that go away, make a very, very viscous solution of the glue. Just use a knife to cover it through. And then after it dries, this can be sanded. And like a miracle, that line will disappear. Joe's skull isn't the only thing that's available on the Figshare site either. Dr. Farkey also included, among other things, a 3D photogrammetric model of Joe's entire skeleton. And this, along with the surface mesh, includes a texturing. So we can see the actual color of each of the bones versus the gray color of the rock matrix. Um, this is not at as high of a resolution as a CT scan or a laser texture scan. But MeshLab can be used to convert the file into an STL, which can be exported into 3D printing software. Um, a few other bones on Joe's skeleton are available in laser texture scans. I think the pedal phalanges and one of the humeri have been scanned that way. In the future, Dr. Farkey may plan to take higher resolution models of some of the bones, so I'd look out for that.